Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. This is episode number 8 of Diesel Engine Assembly for Old 1113. And if you remember back to the last episode, I finally finished up with piston and rod assembly. So now it's time to start thinking about crankshaft. I have that complete set of new old stock main bearings that I sourced for this project oh, way back last spring. They've been here a while. Anyway, the whole set of main bearings is laid out on the bench here in order. Number one main right here. Number two there and there. Number three is the thrust. We have the number four main and rear main, these big wide ones there and there. I've also got 1113's original crankshaft in the crate that I built for it right after I took it out of that horribly frozen and broken engine block. We have a lot of 80 year old Cosmoline on these bearings. I'm going to be cleaning that off tonight. And after the day I had at work today, very, very long Monday. The thought of cleaning Cosmoline and just making parts shiny again sounds downright therapeutic. So I've got my pan of diesel fuel here and an old toothbrush. That seems to work fine for me. This toothbrush is uh, gentle enough it's not going to hurt the Babbitt bearing lining. And this diesel seems to break that Cosmoline down fairly quickly. So it works. That's what I use. Another thing I like about this uh, diesel is it's not going to... Uh, wipe off any of the uh, numbers on here. I'm kind of curious what some of these date codes are on some of these bearings. It'd be kind of interesting to go through those and make note of what they are and see exactly when they were made. Okay, I'm just finishing with this first bearing shell and I've already found something rather interesting I want to show you. So we have a, it's very hard to read the part number up top here, but it is a 1F 4314 and we have a date code of a UNENRM which using Caterpillar's numeral code translates to 103042. So October 30th, 1942, this bearing was made. But the really neat thing, okay, I've been wearing gloves this whole time cleaning this in the diesel. There are traces of old fingerprints that are actually stained onto the Babbitt. See if I can make this GoPro focus. We have one right here, and we have, if I can get the light just right, another one that kind of comes in right here. Um, with my eye, I can see it, they're definite fingerprints, and it looks like somebody at one time had grabbed this bearing shell like that, and that's what put those prints in there, right here and right here. Very neat to think that that may, that may have been the last person that actually touched this in 1942. I mean, who knows? It's possible this could have been unboxed, recoded in Cosmoline, reboxed at one time, but whatever the case, there's a little bit of history on there. I have no idea how old those prints are. Got another one clean and just doing a little bit of an inspection on it, and I can see two things. It's had a couple uh, knocks at one point, this little speck, this dot right here. That's where a sharp cornered square edged something has bumped into it, displaced a little bit of material. And also on this corner right up here, right off the end of the screwdriver right there, that's another spot where it's taken a hit from something that had a squared off edge. And those have displaced material Created little high spots. High spots mean tight spots on a bearing. And you got to remember, just because these have never been used, they are still old. And, you know, there's opportunities for them to have had a past, so to say, so to speak. So, we've got this tool. It's actually, it's a Babbitt scraper. Um, it's made for taking off high spots on Babbitt bearings. Now, usually it's, it's poured Babbitt bearings, not lined, but Babbitt is still Babbitt. So, it's got a rather sharp edge. It's not extremely sharp, but you just go really easy with it. And it's okay to make minute low spots. Basically, you just do not want a high spot on a Babbitt bearing when you start the engine for the first time. It will be a tight area. It may generate some heat. And if it gets warm enough, hot enough, it can actually start displacing bearing material. And you don't want that. A few little scuffs and scratches are not the end of the world on these. Babbitt is made to be soft. It's made to uh, have debris basically uh, impact into it. 
so that it does not just keep gouging around and around and around the crank journals. This one here, we just need to take down and just make it a little bit lower than all the surrounding material. This was quite the high spot right here. Just be patient. I've done this before on other Babbitt line bearings, and even though it makes them look a little bit ugly, it's still better in the long run. Okay, high spots have been removed, and it all feels good. I even made sure that this upper area was nice and flat for good and proper bearing mesh between the halves. This one's done. We carry on. Well, everyone, I have had my Cosmoline therapy for the evening, and the entire new old stock set of main bearings for 1113 is clean and has checked out. I have them laid out in order from front to rear right here on the bench. Again, these are the 1113 original main bearing shells that came out of there. If you remember back to the disassembly process, they were all well within spec yet, but I had number two main starting to lose some of the Babbitt lining off of the steel backing, and number four main was even worse. So, although these can be rebabbed and relined, I'm not going through all that time, expense, and hassle when I was able to find a complete new old stock set ready to go. That having been said, all of these shells are going to be hung on to for more desperate times. And just for kicks, I decided to document all the part numbers and date codes of manufacture for the new old stock bearings that I found just to see when they were made. And it was much like I suspected. It's all World War II era stuff, 41, 42, 1943, on down the line. Uh, and then I wanted to compare that with the 1113 shells. Uh, a lot of 43 stuff in here. Um, there's a 42. The 1941 shell is a real interesting one, though. So we'll take a look at, here was the new old stock shells. And that 41 date code is on the center thrust. The 4B7279 lower shell. The new old stock find is a CUNRU, which is 710 of 1941. 1113's corresponding shell also is a CUNRU, 710 of 41. So that means this bearing shell and this bearing shell, CUNRU, and we have a CUNRU. Both of those pieces were made on the same day in 1941. Just crazy coincidence. The main difference is this one's been in an engine for decades. This one's been sitting on a shelf wrapped in Cosmoline for decades. Just another amazing coincidence. And as long as I was in the cleaning mode, I also got most of the main bearing caps cleaned up and ready. One thing to pay attention to, um, they do have number stampings in these so you can get these in the proper slot and in the proper orientation you can see right here is a very faint number one with the number one align those two and you're positioned properly this one back here has a two and a two and we go three and three four and four five and five all the way back that's how you keep all those in the right spot very important to pay attention to i did hold off on cleaning the rear main bearing cap because i just want to show you something real quick you'll notice this packing that goes down each side of that cap. That is your main oil seal between the cap and the walls of the engine block back here. And the manual states that when you reinstall this cap, you take rope packing and start tamping it down into the bottom of this groove that goes down each side of the main bearing cap with a long punch and a hammer and just basically force that stuff in there and make it just a friction fit so it will seal that potential leak path of oil coming through that gap and running out the back. And this is just textbook example of how this stuff is supposed to be installed. That's why I left it to get it on camera. I didn't peel it out, but you can see how it zigzags from one side to the other to the other. It just zs back and forth and back and forth. That is exactly how this stuff is supposed to be installed. And I just wanted to show you that before I peeled it all out. We are going to try and replicate this to the best of our abilities. After this has been cleaned up, new bearing shells have been put in, clearances have been verified, and we have to reseal it. That's how it's done. Just cleaning this uh, rear main bearing cap. And one final talking point, I always be sure to clear out these hollow dowels that locate the bearings, you can always find some nasty junk down in those things, and especially if you're working on an engine that has failed. Because these 
face down when they're installed in the block, they always catch anything that had uh, been rolling around between that bearing insert and the crankshaft gets deposited down there. It's a easy spot to overlook. Every one of these bearing caps has one and you always want to make sure you get in there, blast it out with some, even some brake clean, some compressed air until you get absolutely nothing else coming out of there. Because if you put this engine back together and everything's nice and new and tight and then your fresh oil starts loosening any of that crud, it's going to migrate right out and start rolling around and around again. So one very important thing, be sure not to overlook it. Now that everything's finally clean, I'll start laying in some of the bearing shells. And I always like to put just a light film of oil on the back sides. Anything that's going to be a metal on metal fit gets some sort of oil barrier between. Also uh, get it on the saddle area for the bearing insert on the block. Don't need a lot just to put a film on there. You just don't want it dry. Then lay the bearing in. These uh, main bearings are arranged such on a D3400 that each insert can only go into one spot. You really can't get things mixed up. If it's not size difference like width, depth, it's the location of that dowel hole that kind of locates the bearing somewhere offset, somewhere right in the center. So with all those vari variables in place, nothing can be installed incorrectly down here. Here's number two main, and again, the location of the dowel hole dictates which shell goes in the block and which shell goes into the cap. In the block, this one is centered. In the cap, it is offset, so you can't get those two mixed up. Center main, it's also the thrust, so these inserts can be a little bit tighter fit because the edges will actually go down and surround the saddle area which is a good thing. You don't want to have any unnecessary play with these. Work it down in. It's all right if it's a tight fit, that's a good thing. There we are. That's seated, feels good. Number four main now, and again, that dowel hole is centered. It's identical to number two, so pretty easy to know where that shell is supposed to go. And finally, the rear main. Largest bearing shell of the bunch. Interesting fact, these D3400s don't have a rear main seal. Instead, they just have a really, really wide bearing. That'll become more evident when we have the crankshaft in front of us. So being a larger bearing, it's gonna take a little bit more force to get it seated. This is where I use my plastic hammer. Just carefully do not hammer the babbit. Make sure you're on the metal. There, that's sounding more solid. We're done. All right, so I've loaded the shells into the corresponding bearing caps. I'm just placing these on just to kind of get a look at everything. Gauging how it fits, we're gonna leave that big rear main out for now. That thing is so wide, it takes a puller to get it back out. So we're not gonna mess with that for now, just to look at it. But I must say, everything is fitting and looking very, very nice. So, next up, I need to start working that crankshaft over. Get it cleaned, get it polished, and we'll start fitting it in there, see how it spins, see what our clearances are. That's the last leg of the process that really makes me a little bit nervous because that's the best crankshaft I have on the place. And if I find a problem with that, I really don't have a good plan B. But, well, I might have a plan B, but I'd really, really rather not have to go there. Anyway, that's hopefully we'll never get to that. So that's going to do it for tonight and probably for this video. Uh, it's getting late time to go in, call it a day. Lots to do at work again tomorrow. Yay. So anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Hope to see you back again.